Let us draw to the Lord in prayer once more. Our gracious Father, we thank you now that we have come to the hearing and the proclamation of your word. And we pray that by your Holy Spirit, we would be able to receive the life that is contained in these words. Provide for us the very, your very heart, O God, in understanding the importance of this one flesh union where you brought man and his wife together. Lord, how simple this is to the world, how neglected it is even. But Lord, allow your house to understand the depths of it that we may live. Teach us, give us ears to hear, hearts to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this Lord's Day evening, we return back to Genesis 2.24. And on the subject of the husband, really, we're going to be here for a long time because we will then move over to the role of the wife. But I believe it'll be three more Lord's Day evenings on the subject of the husband uh, before we move forward with the wife, as there's many things to consider. And for some time now, as you know, we have been studying the position of the husband, who according to scripture is the head of his wife and the image and glory of God. And what a honor that the man would be described in this way by the writing of the Apostle Paul, inspired of the Holy Spirit, that man who is placed in this one flesh union would be described as the head of his wife and to even bear the very image of God, the glory of God. And I say again that this is of the Lord's mercy and kindness to provide this revelation or this revelation in his word, especially today when we live in a world where there's such neglect on husbandhood where we live in a world of unfaithfulness and uh, there is great um, denial of this God-ordained design that is given to us in Genesis chapter 2. And so it is of the Lord's mercy and kindness that he teaches us this. It is not a subject that you will see series upon series on series of teachings on it. Um, it. It's not found in most places. And so husbands... The thing that we ought to thank the Lord for is that he's merciful toward us to give us this word that we may live uh, with our wives in such that, that godly and holy way. And now I believe that as we live in this world of unfaithfulness and such neglect to God's order, uh, the result of the husband's neglect will eventually lead to the woman's mar marring and the crumbling of the family. Uh, unfaithfulness will be everywhere and the children will scatter as it begins from the top all the way down. And so we pray tonight that the, that the God of all grace may provide us faithful husbands who will love and remain faithful to their wives. And so may we hear his words this evening and live. So far we have meditated upon the husband's Christ-like love towards his wife how the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 5 that we are to love, or the husbands are to love his wife as Christ loved the church. And really that is the example that we've been looking at in every single um, area of the husband's position and, and role. We cannot l but look at the Lord Jesus' as example. He is the prime example, the highest example of how a husband ought to love his wife. And so we understood that. And even moving forward to maintaining his authority, to remain faithful and to have that holy uh, disposition in his heart where he has a faithful and true speech, a conduct that is worthy, a life that is without reproach, and that he is not despised, but he has that example of Christ, the closest image of Christ before his wife. And tonight we continue our meditation in the managing of the husband's authority. And I believe that a major part of the husband's responsibility in his marriage is to order his marriage in the truth. The husband is not just somebody who calls himself of high position or just accepts the fact that he's been placed in a high role. But God has given him the responsibility to order his marriage always in the truth. He is not to order this marriage according to his own opinion or by what he sees. He must always remain faithful in ordering his marriage according to the truth of God's word. For in his love toward her, 
The man does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. We read this in 1 Corinthians 13. With application to the husband, this ought to be seen all the more. That he denies ungodliness, he hates the sin in his marriage, and he is more than willing, more than ready to use the sword to sanctify the marriage in the truth that is presented in God's word. And with the authority that he bears, he is required to do so. This is not an option for him. He must use the sword. We learned last Lord's Day evening that he is not always, he doesn't always have the sword, um, slicing and dicing everyone in his house, but he has it ready and he is ready to unsheath it at the times that evil is present. And he uses it to reprove his wife when good and right reason presents itself. And so I am specifically speaking to his correcting of his wife, for he is the one that is placed before her that he may teach her, instruct her, as we learned last Lord's Day evening, but also to correct her and to watch her way, to bring those reproofs, not to shoot her down, but to help her walk in the way of purity. Again, it is of God's grace that he would put two sinners together than to remind them that they must both look to him. And remember, when God created Adam and Eve, this first holy marriage, they understood that God must be who they set their minds upon, who they set their focus upon. They must conduct themselves in the light of God who created all things. But after the fall, this is something that must be recovered in the minds of men and women, husbands and wives, to remind them that they must order themselves in the light of God's truth, especially now revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ. His sword, the husband's sword, serves as that special means to draw his wife away from sinning and dying. How important is this sword to be used? If there is true love for his wife, he will guard her soul with his life and ensure that that sword is always ready lest she falls into the fire, lest she continues in sin, and lest on the day of judgment, God will judge her and cast her away. His sword is always ready and is that special means that God has given to him that he may protect her from sinning and dying. It is such a great mark of love for him to always be ready and willing to free her from her wretched habits and patterns as to pull her out of the fire, as to take her out of the deep waters. It is a great mark of love when a husband is always willing to correct. And this should not be misinterpreted by wives, especially when done in gentleness, because there is a necessity for it. It is for your own safety. It is for your own good. We learn in scripture that open rebuke is better than secret love. And so it is of great curse to husbands and wives when Reproof is not accepted, when reproof is not practiced, when the sword is not pulled out, when sin is present and we allow it to uh, be um, present among us and to have its way in us. And so it is such a great mark of love when the wife is able to see that her husband is always ready, uh, ready and always willing, always ready and always willing. And this reproof is not just so he can pinpoint her flaws, or her evils. The scripture teaches us in the words of Solomon, Proverbs 15, 31, that this reproof, and this is with regards to godly reproof, because the man's reproof must be in the truth. And if it's truthful reproof, godly reproof, then Solomon calls this life-giving reproof. It is not just a correction just to point out that she's wrong. I can see that this is a common thing within marriages, to prove the other party wrong always. And the joy that one has to prove the other side wrong is really nothing to gain from proving one wrong. But with this godly reproof and this with, with the sword which cleanses her, there's purpose. There's great use and um, again, purpose for it. And the purpose is that it would give her life. Solomon calling it life-giving means that this is the way she ought to live in the path of righteousness. In another text, in chapter 6 of Proverbs, in verse 23, 
He considers reproof as the way of life. And so how important it is that the husbands show her the way of life. Again, it is beyond just saying what she has done wrong, but it is meant to lead her to live. It is a means to create, a means to preserve her, and a means to escape eternal damnation. Again, Christ is our ultimate example. What would we ever do if the Lord Jesus came and never corrected us from our sins, never brought reproof? Who was the greatest example and is still the greatest example in the Holy Spirit who brings reproof upon reproof upon reproof. Even after being redeemed in our sinful flesh, when we fail, the Spirit's conviction brings us to the knowledge of our sin and corrects us. And He does so that we may live. Remember, uh, we are bastard children if there is no correction. We are abandoned if there is no one to guide us and to lead us. And again, the final words of the Lord Jesus who said that the Holy Spirit will come. He will reprove the world of sin. And so greatly is the reproof of the Lord for His church that we may be sanctified until He comes. And so reproof is a good thing. And husbands, we ought to understand that that's a regular, or a regular thing that we ought to practice. Not that we are always looking for fault, but always alert like a faithful watchman, diligent, looking if the enemy is coming over our fences. Willing to blow our shofars, going down and warning our wives when we see that the unclean thing has touched her. Or when she has touched the unclean thing. It is of great love to preserve her from sin. And it is an unloving thing to watch her sin and to watch her die in her sin. Surely, the husband's godly reproof, again, according to Scripture, Psalm 141, verse 5, is called kindness. The man's reproof is called kindness. Matter of fact, in that same text, it is described as a precious ointment, or uh, better in our understanding today, a precious oil that is placed over one's head. When reproof is given, it is as though we are curing the person before us. And in Scripture, we see the faithful examples of loving and kind husbands who use this precious ointment over the heads of their wives. In Genesis 30, we've we read of Jacob and his faithful reproving of his Rachel. In Job's day, we read of his reproving of his wife, who was getting him to abandon and curse God. In David's day, when his Michal mocked him for his celebration of the coming of the presence of God in the Ark of Covenant, David reproved his Michal. And all of these reproofs are seen in faithful husbands all over Scripture. That if we put them all together, time would not be enough tonight. But again, most of all, aside from all of those men, Christ is the greatest example who reproves his bride from every evil thing, leading her always into the path of his righteousness. Now, I'd like you to understand that Christ is holy far beyond any husband in this world. And when Christ reproves, there is a great difference between my reproof, your husband's reproof, compared to Christ. Why it's so different is because he is considered the thrice holy God who has no sin. And really, he had the right to reprove anyone and anyone he saw before him because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so this thrice holy God who made himself known in the flesh reproves the world of sin and continues to reprove the world of sin in the Holy Spirit. But he takes his bride, redeems her with his blood, washes her white as snow, and continues to cleanse her day after day after day after day. And you read the Gospels. It is in a whole collection of the reproof of Christ. 
from the beginning to the end, and even after the gospel record records, you see that there is the Spirit of Christ correcting, correcting, correcting. I love the fact that the Lord has not ended or did not stop his reproof. Again, what would we do? We would be so lost. We would be left in sin. We would become numb eventually where no one would keep us and hold us accountable. But that Holy Spirit, the faithful Holy Spirit, who always reasons with us, brings to our understanding our sin through his word. This is the active working of God in his love for you and I. And Christ so loved his wife that he snatched her from the pits of, his, of her depravity and gave her life. Hence, if husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church, you must be willing, you must be ready to use the sword in truth. Otherwise, you are in an ineffective husband. As much as this is hurtful to say, you become a useless husband. An authority that is negated. It is an authority that is without effect. And again, it does not put to display the very glory of God in you. Especially if it is a man who is in the truth, as a man in ho who conducts himself in other ways in holiness, and if that is not seen from his own, or seen by his own wife, again he is ineffective toward her. And again, with the ineffectiveness of husbands, I think the great reason why many husbands do not use the sword is because of their fearful minds of insulting her or offending her. Desireful not to bring her in a state where she is upset with him. Husbands who in their thinking or in their, uh, they think that they are doing good for her but are actually damaging her because they are tolerating sin. They see it with their very own eyes. God has given them eyes to discern. And to not use the sword is to tolerate the continuance of sin. And I tell you, this is the greatest act of hatred. This is unloving. When you do not snatch your wives from the fire of sin. Hear the words of Leviticus, uh, Leviticus 19, 17. This is a command that's given to the nation. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. But you shall reason frankly with your neighbor. I like the older English. You shall rebuke. You shall rebuke your neighbor. Lest you incur sin because of him. What is the command saying? Well, it is saying that it is hatred for a man not to rebuke his sinning neighbor. And you will be a partaker of the man's sin by not exposing it. By not holding that person accountable. You have not cured anything. You've just covered it. And people say, covering it with love. No. That is not love when you do not expose the wrong. And so there are a lot of husbands who see the wrong, but yet are quiet with regards to correction. They wait for, and I've, I've, I've spoken with some who've said, Pastor, I'm just waiting for the right time. But what if she dies? What if it's too late? What happens when she becomes numb in her heart? And the days that pass, that pass the seconds that pass, because of your delay, harden her heart even further. You ought to love her enough to correct her immediately. It is sin before God. Now, if you cannot at that right at that time, be in prayer, be in much prayer. Seek the Lord in wisdom and how you will approach her. 
But brothers, you must understand that the silent treatment is sin. And it goes the other way where maybe the man doesn't want to say anything because he is waiting for the right time. But on the other note, he sees it, he's offended. And the way he deals with it, instead of correcting it openly, he gives her the silent treatment. He doesn't sleep with her on the bed. He sleeps on the couch. They don't talk to each other for hours. That is sin. Because you are withholding correction. You are not being just. You're an unjust king. You're an unjust ruler, an unjust leader. Where people put uh, cases before you and you're unable to deal with them and handle them. You must be willing, knowing that it is wrong. You know what is right. You must act according to God's word. On the other hand, there are some who may not be so silent, but have lost their patience in correcting them. Pastor, I've corrected them so many times. She just doesn't listen. Hence, he is tempted and loses his patience, and he just stops. He doesn't correct her anymore. And I've heard this too. What's the, whole, what's the point of correcting her if she's not going to listen to my correction? I've heard husbands tell me, I don't want to correct somebody who doesn't want to be corrected. You must correct her while she has life. As long as she lives. Look at what the word of God says in James 4. Or listen to what it says here, verse 17. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Amen? Yes. The question is, do you know right and wrong? Do you know according to, what, according to God's word, righteousness, unrighteousness, good and evil, right and wrong? Well, you must be a man of the word. You must be in prayer. You must be discerning. Must be awake. If you can discern a man who is coming with violence compared to a man who is gentle, then you should be able to discern the sins of your wife, her deeds of evil and her deeds of good. But you must know what is right. And you must act upon it lest you sin. Matter of fact, he wants us to practice reproof. That it came from the very words of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. The very system of reproof. You see, God is so holy that he desires that the husband would be his man. To express his holiness within his marriage. God wants every husband to be his spokesman of the thrice holy God. The whole scripture is reproof. And Jesus himself, when he came into the flesh, gave us the very system of discipline and reproof. Let's open our Bibles, please, and turn it to Matthew chapter 18 and just read that one verse and go back to it later on tonight. Matthew 18, verse 15. Now look at this. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Our Lord himself teaches us to tell our brother his fault. Then how much more should you who loves your wife tell her her fault at the hour of her stumbling. You must take her in the private room and discuss to her her sin, reveal to her her sin. And so 
with that in mind, it is very important then that we move forward in understanding how the husband is to handle his correcting of her. Because we have now the general understanding that according to God's word, it is just right, whether it be a Christian in general, is uh, called to reprove a sinning brother. But now in the context of a husband who is the image and glory of God, who is ready always and willing to correct his sinning wife, how is he to handle that? Because it can go in many directions. There are husbands who become abusive, become violent, all about reproof. Again, all about cutting and wounding her without understanding, again, in wisdom, how to deal with her in correcting her. How is the ha husband to handle reproof well? Well, like last Lord's Day evening, we learned that the instruction and his commandment or commanding of her should be done always with gentleness. And so it's the same with his correction of her, should always be seasoned with gentleness. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in the spirit of gentleness. Again, this is assumed that the husband is the spiritual one. And it must be. Not that you are competing with her, but you always must be walking in the spirit. You always must be a man of God's word. A man of prayer. A man always watching. That if caught in transgression, you who is able to expose the sin of others and bring them and restore them back to the way of God, you must do it in the spirit of gentleness. That is a gentle, sharp, verbal correction. Sh gentle because it is of truth. It is not out to injure. It does not beat around the bush. It is direct, hence it's sharp, because that admonishing of her of course brings her to shame it is healing her no different than a wound that when you touch it put salt on it it cures that very wound so it is a gentle sharp but verbal correction not a hidden one not a correction that goes beyond words The Lord, again in his example, used his mouth to correct. He never rolled his fist like a ball and went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Peter. The Lord, always in patience, always in gentleness, yet always sharp in the truth, giving verbal correction, never going beyond words. Uh, Proverbs 25, 15, it speaks of a tongue that is soft. And the soft tongue is able to break a bone or break the bone. And there it's describing how sharp and yet how gentle the tongue and its effectiveness can be when used in that way. And the idea here is the heart of a man. A soft tongue is able to go into the heart of your neighbor. In the context of your wife, you're able to deliver that correction so deep into her heart by speaking in this manner. A soft tongue. Soft yet powerful to break the pride of your hearer. Why? Because you speak in the truth. Again, remember how the Lord Jesus spoke even before his own enemies. When he was arrested, before Pilate. Do you see him having to fight back, having to scream? You see in his words such gentleness, yet sh such sharpness. And that they, he left them often speechless, often examining their own self. Why? Because he always spoke in the truth. 
The truth does not need extra help from you to act in, uh, beyond what the truth says. You must merely speak the truth and the Holy Spirit's sharpness, the sword of God, will pierce deep into the very soul of a man. And so the correction of the husband is a correction without insult, without contempt, without shameful words, without the use of them. How many marriages and husbands in their marriages have insulted their wives using shameful words, cursing at her? Because he's had enough, he's been provoked, he's been pushed to his limits, his way of correcting her is not Christ-like. But your correction must emulate Christ. Amen? Yes. With regards to abuse and violence, brothers, never find yourself forcing correction upon your wife. Because instead of a soft tongue, many husbands would rather cast their wives away and out. A few years ago uh, in the church, we had to house uh, one of, or a married woman, because she was being abused at home by her husband. May it never be. That is the greatest act of hatred and you will not solve anything by force. Do you realize that which fills the emptiness of a person's heart, that which corrects the evil of one's heart, is not your truth, your own made correction. It is the correction of God on high. It is the truth of God alone that is able to cure the fault of man. So I pray that you would practice this. Those of you who may have a great anger, who is short-tempered, easy to be flustered and irritated, remember you must not disqualify yourself from this position of husbandhood. Because then it would be difficult for you to recover what was lost. Remember, correction, reproof is life-giving, according to Solomon, not destroying. And so when you correct her, have it in mind the goal, which is to bring her to life. People think that being a pastor, the joy, uh, the, the, the fun of being a pastor is to scold everybody that is in front of him. But honestly, there is no joy in having to speak in that way. But it must be done because the goal is to correct, it's to bring them to life. It is that they may walk faithfully before the Almighty God because it will be upon my head if I do not speak to you the truth. One day the judge of the earth will come and he will open the books and judge us according to our works. And so how loving it is that pastors, brothers, and husbands are more than willing to correct their wives to life. But it's also important as we speak on the subject of quick uh, to anger or easily flustered and unable to correct her immediately, it is of wisdom then that husband should be advised to consider the right time and when to correct her. Do not correct her at a time when you are enraged because then all that's going to come out of your mouth is your flesh. Not a soft word, not a soft tongue. 
And consider the other way around as well. Do not correct her when she is enraged because there could be, and there are, quite angry women out there. But do not correct her when she is enraged lest she provokes you and you are tempted by her and you join her in her sin. The pride of the man is so great that he will not allow anyone under him to treat him that way. So think carefully when you will do this, immediately, promptly, but do not do it at the wrong time, lest all it becomes is a time of shouting, a time of argument. You are to be well composed before giving a rebuke. Imagine if the Lord Jesus Christ, and it can never be, I mean, we see it in the Word of God, it'll, it wasn't never in His example where He walked in sin. And so even using Him as an example is difficult, but looking at apostles or the messengers of God in the New Testament, could you imagine if all they did was come to the pulpit with anger and fleshly anger, not holy indignation, but fleshly anger, they would murder and butcher the church. But they always came in the spirit of wisdom and gentleness, composed before giving rebuke. And she too must be composed before you rebuke her. Because anger clouds the judgment, especially when she, is, when she or you reached a point of great darkness, your judgment is gone. To hear correction at the hour of rage is so difficult. And this is why you'll often see that it requires time where the rage has passed. And then they come back together to discuss because then their minds are able to think carefully of what is being said. It is a demonstration of wisdom, husbands. And really, it is of respect to your, husband, uh, sorry, to your wives because you respect her enough to weigh her temper lest she sins even more. She may not know that. She may never understand that. But you should. You need to have observed her, assessed her, know her abilities, her capacities, the extent in which she can go before you deliver reproof. But what kind of reproof are we giving here? Is it just, I don't like your shoes. You should wear this kind of shoes. Your food is lacking salt. You should add salt. That's not how you do it. This is how. No, all of those things, earthly things, may be beneficial. But that's not the type of reproof that we are speaking of here. It's not just any random reproof. It is a correction that is always just. It is a correction that is always on the grounds of God's word. Again, never on the grounds of your opinions. And it is just in the sense that you are not just accusing her of something you thought of or something that you assumed it to be. Your correction must be on the grounds of something that you have witnessed, something that is evidently true. A thing that is known. A thing that you are sure of. You cannot correct your wives on something that is not truly known, something you are unsure of then it will bring you to shame. Then it's the misuse of the sword. And it is assuming on God that that is right. Think about that, husbands. When you incorrectly correct her, you are using the truth of God in a twisted way without considering whether it's correct. Is it true? Is it evident? I see that no different than a heretic who preaches a false gospel. 
I see that no different than a wolf who twists the word of God. No different than the evil one in the Psalms who twists the word of God. Don't use the sword the wrong way. Because then you have insisted upon her conscience that God is leading you to correct her on something that is not true. Something that is not sure. Something that is on the grounds of your assumption. Be careful. You should not be quick to lay the blame upon her before proof is present. And no, do not trap her. No, do not set her up so that she may fall. Do not lure her in to expose who she is internally. Those are not, of, that's not of God. Think about this. In 1 Timothy 5, when the Apostle Paul is speaking in the context of the correction of an elder, when there are brethren who accuse the elder of a fault, he says that it should be confirmed, validated by two or three witnesses. In other words, it is made sure. Uh, it is not just he said, she said. And then the violent use of the sword unnecessarily. And I see that as a great example to husbands that if to that extent, in the context of an elder who has failed, it requires witnesses who've also, by the Holy Spirit, observed and determined that to be the case, then also in a marriage, a holy union that God has made, that the husband should be completely sure. Now, I'm not saying go take two or three witnesses um, inside your house to watch how things are going there. But that should serve as an example that you ought to be so sure, lest you make a great and damaging mistake. Amen? And I'll tell you, there is no good fruit that will ever proceed from unjust reproofs. Only unhappiness, hidden bitterness, hatred, and before your children, open arguments and shouting battles, shame, reproach on the name of Christ. And so I pray that you may be found correcting her fairly, lest you bring danger to her soul and give a bad example to your family. Having them think that this is the correction of the Lord, this is the reproof of a heavenly father, you ought to be careful. Amen? On another note, it is important when giving correction, or at least before giving this correction, that you see to it that you are not committing the same sin that you are correcting her for or correcting her of. Because that sword that you're about to unsheath, if you are committing the same sin, you have blunted the edge of that sword, it will do no damage. It will have no effect is what I'm saying. That sword which is to cut sin instead of cutting it has no effect because you are doing the same thing. Remember the words of the Lord in Matthew 7. He says, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Lest you think that tonight it's free for all, it's yes, I have the ability to correct her. You must examine yourself. Lest your correction bounces back to you. Remember when Paul was rebuking the religious hypocrites of his day, the, those uh, Pharisees, the Jews who held on to the law, who held on to circumcision. What did he say in chapter 2 of Romans, verse 21? You then who teach others, do you not teach yourselves also?
And that's the great responsibility of a man who has been placed there. And that's why I say that the husband's position is no different than a man who is leading a church. He must always examine, always watch the way he lives. He must pray to God to keep him faithful, to remain faithful, that his way would be made pure. Lest when he gives the word, it bounces back because he has not taught himself the truth. So there's hypocrisy in that. It's a lack of wisdom in discerning your own self and your own state. A man who cannot even see himself is not fit to, to serve others and correct others. But what I think makes this worse is that giving correction regarding a sin that you too are committing, you serve as the heaviest witness before God's throne against yourself. And the Word of God says that in the same chapter, in verse 1 of chapter 2 of Romans. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself. Because you, the judge, practice the very same things. On the day of judgment, how the Lord will point at you and tell you, you are the very witness to your own sin. And Jesus calls them hypocrites. And so it is good for us to hear from God's word that you are to live a life without reproach that you would not be hindered in your reproofs in your corrections I know this could be discouraging as well I've spoken to husbands who have said pastor I'm just so discouraged I don't know where to begin I see sin in my family but I'm just not fit and it will take time it will take hours of healing where there is counsel provided prayer with him I've heard one say pastor maybe I need to wait when I am fully clean before I say these things you'll never become perfect and so there is this balance of understanding the Lord's forgiveness. There is a balance of understanding the Lord's mercy and grace. That if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of them. And yet there is also a way in which we bring forth that correction, knowing that your wife, who knows you more than anyone else, sees the same sin. You must confess to her your sin as well. And show her the word of God. And humbling yourself... That you do not come as a man righteous, not coming as a man who has something to boast of in himself. But you come with the correction of the Lord who has also corrected you. And you, you and your love desiring to cure her and heal her, give the word of God. That's why it's so important that when we give reproof, we don't come in our name. We always bring the word of God, the word of God which is the grounds, the authority of our lives. Now, what happens, pastor, if a wife does not regard rebuke privately? This also is a true thing, a very common thing, where the wife, according to Genesis, remember at the fall, she is one who has a contrary desire from him. She then has in her flesh a natural leaning to unruliness. It was her who initiated taking the fruit. It was her that was tempted. Paul makes this clear to the Corinthians. She has this natural leaning to defy authority. And so, what happens if a wife does not regard rebuke in secret? If a man is faithful at home and he is bringing with the spirit of gentleness correction, but she will not listen. Well, we go back to Matthew 18. I hope your Bibles are still there.
The husbands have every right to proceed in Christ's direction of discipline. And he must do that for the sake of her soul. Now look at this. Verse 16. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So that would be the fitting moment when you would bring outsiders. Now, not unbelievers, but those outside your home. It would be of great benefit that it be trustworthy, faithful believers who you know will be of wisdom to handle, to observe, to discern, and to give scriptural advice and to act according to the Lord's order here. And so you don't just put anybody in. You don't bring anybody in. There are those who say, bring your parents, bring your uh, siblings in. You must bring faithful, trustworthy, wise believers. And the husband has every right to call on these believers to make his case known and to confront her before them, her sin. Now that, to many, may say, uh, may feel or seem as it's too much, it's too harsh. But remember, it is out of your love for her soul that you take it to this extent. That if she will not listen to your counsel, you must take it to that degree. What? What for? Why does the Lord give us this structure? So that she may be brought to shame, that she may be brought to repentance. And so it is not good as well, husbands, to hide even the sins of the home. Especially when the family is in church, in a church, committed to a church. If it is getting out of hand internally, you must bring others who will hold her accountable. And the same goes the other way. But when we get to the wives, we'll get there. But you must bring it forward to the pastor. You must bring it forward to trustworthy brethren. Lest the sin continues. And it is unloving. And I've heard stories of this. Where the church has been made no, uh, the, the pastors have known of this sin. And they did not do anything about it. Remember the wise counsel of Paul to the man who committed sins of immorality in the first epistles to the Corinthians. Hand him over to Satan. That sounds harsh, but hand him over. And it is assumed that that's the same man in the second epistle who comes back overwhelmed with many sorrows. And Paul says, welcome him, lest he be overtaken by sorrow. And so that's the goal of reproof. It's to bring forth repentance. It's to bring forth life, confession of sins before the holy God. And so you have every right to follow the pattern of scripture, pattern of our word, uh, Lord here. And really, if she will not listen, even with faithful witnesses, then you must bring it before the congregation. Now, of course, there are many things to consider. What if she's an unbeliever? Now, Peter speaks of something similar to, with regards to a believing wife and an unbelieving husband. But I see the same application there that you are to win her by your life. A life of faith, a life of purity. And so there's wisdom involved in so many things. And how we are to use it is important. Well, pastor, and this is the motive of the Pharisees when they asked the Lord Jesus, what, what, what grounds can we divorce our wives? Because they were so frustrated. I mean, in the days of Moses, they wanted to do away with their wives because she did not uh, arrange her hair in a certain way. She didn't wear this. She's so many weird and strange reasons. <clears throat> but you cannot unwife her because you've been placed in a holy union, except for the ground on the grounds of marital unfaithfulness. 
or she's committed adultery. But other than that, if possible, forgiveness, if possible, reconciliation, if possible, restoration. But you cannot unwife her simply because she does not listen at the first or second or third correction. Then what, Pastor? You must live in patience and in deep prayer all the days of your life in love for her, but at the same time marking her as a heathen who has not come to know the truth. That is a difficult thing for many. But the, by the grace of God, may he teach you to love as the Lord Jesus did, that the wife of your bosom may be brought to repentance and that she, together with you, would walk in the ways of righteousness. But how blessed are you, husbands, if the Lord Jesus Christ opened the hearts of your wives to salvation, who has given her life and is able to take the correction of God's word, to take the reproof of Christ where she has confessed her sin before the holy God. How blessed are you to be given a wife who loves the Lord. So guard her with your heart. Prepare always, day after day. Be ready and always willing that even that saved wife of yours can fail. Correct her in love. Remind her of God's forgiveness. Lead her in the ways of of life. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these words you have given us this evening. And Lord, certainly the words of Jude are brought in our minds here to snatch one out of the fire. And Lord, may it be so that our husbands, myself even, would always be watching that at those times that our wives may be found in sin, or in the fire of, of, of sin, that we may be more than willing to snatch them out of it. Always prepared, always willing, always ready. But Lord, teach us in wisdom and give us a heart of patience. Grant us the spirit of gentleness, Lord, lest we butcher and murder and become violent. Teach us, O oh God, to use your sword. It is your sword properly, orderly. Lord, you have placed husbands as the watchman, the very pastor of his home, the very pastor of his marriage. Grant us, O oh Lord, the ability to lead our wives and our children in the ways of righteousness, that our lips would not be sealed when it comes to correcting our wives. But on the other hand, may we not be aggressive and lose temper, lose control, lose judgment, lest, O oh God, we put reproach and bring reproach upon your name. Help us live in the balance of your words that we may live with our wives in obedience to your holy word. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.